Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on where you're at. We're just jumping on here. We're going to give it a couple minutes as people roll in. Appreciate you guys attending another live directed IRA workshop. Got a very, very special guest, a guy that I've known for over a decade now that I consider one of the experts in the industry. Um, he's going to provide some amazing content and some education for you guys, if you're interested in learning more about real estate, specifically kind of where the market is, where the market, it looks like it's going in 2024. Um, but also when it comes to real estate, understanding exit strategies. I think that's one of the key components to understanding real estate is know what you're going to do with the property when you buy it. Or if something weird happens, what are some alternative ways that you can get out of properties or exit properties in the most cost efficient manner? And I've got none, none better than Mr. Texas Real Estate, Jason Bible, who's going to join us here in a second. So um, just as a reminder, we've got two functions. If you guys want to chat or ask questions, the chat box, feel free to use that. If you guys want to do a little networking on the side, kind of say like, hey, I'm so-and-so from Tennessee or whatever, um, use that chat box for some communication. Uh, always open to networking and letting you guys do that. But if you guys have specific questions for me or for Jason, put it in the Q&A box. And I've got a moderator, Cassandra, who will kind of moderate that and dish out questions either during the, the uh, workshop or we'll catch them at the end. We're going to try to shave off 10 minutes at least at the end to answer all your guys' questions. So again, I want to welcome everybody. If you guys are not familiar to the program, this is a workshop that we do twice a month uh, where we provide all education. We don't sell investments to anybody. All of our guests that we have on do not sell investments either. This is purely to provide education to anybody that wants it, wants it, whether you're a client of directed IRA or not, on what is a self-directed IRA, how can it be used, how can it be used specifically for real estate investing, and what are some different techniques that you can use to exponentially grow your retirement account and get it out of the traditional stocks, bonds, mutual funds, and CDs that we're accustomed to. To investing in. So um, again, my name is Nate Hare. I'm the, I'm the executive director here at Directed IRA. I have some announcements at the end. So stick to the end because we've got some cool events that are coming up that Jason's actually going to be a part of. So stick all the way to the end. Make sure you guys catch that. But I'm going to jump into this and share my screen and just share a couple quick um, uh, slides for anybody who is new. And then we'll kick it over to uh, Jason and let him run away with this. So let me just share my screen a sec. Okay. Cass, let me know if you cannot see that, but it should be going. So we're gonna talk real briefly about exit strategies when it comes to real estate. And as a reminder, directed IRA, we manage retirement accounts that can be invested in real estate. So really, all investment strategies when it comes to real estate can be applied one way or another to a retirement account. So when we bring Jason on, just always think in the back of your head, what Jason is talking about, whatever strategies or exit strategies he's talking about can be related to an IRA or specifically a self-directed IRA. So what we're going to cover in 50 minutes, we're going to bring Jason on here in a second. He's going to give us a little bit of an outlook to 2024 throughout the presentation, but he's going to talk about how to make mo more money with less deals and specifically, which I'm very excited to hear, is alternative exit strategies in a low inventory world, because that is what we're facing in pretty much any market when you look at real estate uh, investments across the country. I'll come back and tie, tie everything into uh, how you can apply these strategies to your retirement account, whether it's an IRA or a 401k, the benefits of owning real estate in an IRA or 401k, and then we'll kick off some Q&A at the end for myself and for uh, Jason. As a reminder, I have to always remind people, this is education-based only. We're not giving tax, legal, or investment advice. That's something that directed IRA cannot do as a self-directed IRA custodian. So even though I'm an investor and we've got a lot of principals who are investors here, this is just merely for education. We're not selling you anything. This is just to make you guys better or knowledgeable investors so you can more properly use your self-directed retirement accounts or just use your own cash if you're investing in real estate inside and outside of an IRA. If you're new to the program, just real briefly, we've got a ton of education online that covers this. We're not going to go too deep into the nuts and bolts of how it works. But just so you know, 
your retirement account, your IRAs or your 401ks can be invested in all sorts of investments, not just traditional stocks, bonds, mutual funds. The things that we hold here at Directed IRA, if you choose to invest your IRA or old 401ks into them, what we call alternative investments. Alternative investments are things like rental properties, fix and flips, commercial property, multifamily, private equity, private stocks, syndications, notes and loans, cryptocurrency, and a whole lot more. When it comes to your retirement account, the IRS only limits us to not holding two investments in our plans. The only two things you're not allowed to own in a retirement plan are life insurance contracts and collectibles. That's it. If you want to own things like rental property, if you want to own things like multifamily, if you want to own things outside of the traditional markets, all you have to do is find a company like Directed IRA that will facilitate the buying and selling of those investments using your retirement plan. We call it a self-directed IRA, but really self-directed is just a marketing term. An IRA at Fidelity follows the same set of rules as an IRA at Directed IRA. The only difference is Fidelity is a licensed securities broker that sells investments. Directed IRA is not. Directed IRA doesn't have any investments to sell you. So in our account agreement, when you establish a retirement plan with us, it just says invest in anything the IRS allows, but you have to tell us what that investment is. You have to find it. That's where the self-directed component comes in. So you find the investments, but you work the investments through us, your self-directed IRA custodian, so that it's still considered an IRA investment and you still get all your tax benefits, whether that's tax deferred or tax-free growth. So what does directed IRA do? We solve a problem. We solve the problem investors face when it comes to limited investment choice by allowing our clients to use their IRAs, old 401ks, old 403bs, old TRS, TSPs, HSAs, ESAs, and other tax advantage qualified plans to invest in non-traditional or alternative investments like real estate notes and loans. Now, the reason why we have these programs though, is because what we see is that most people want to self-direct, but they get stuck in the mud because either A, they haven't really found an investment that makes sense to them. They're not knowledgeable enough about investing in real estate or otherwise, but they want to invest in things. They're not satisfied with their returns in the market. So we do these workshops twice a month. And sometimes we'll bring on guests like we have today to help kind of kickstart and give you some ideas as to what you might be able to do and provide you some better education so that you are a better self-directed IRA investor and that you have more knowledge when it comes to picking your own investments. So we'll talk a little bit more about self-directed IRAs at the end here, but I want to bring on uh, my good friend, Jason Bible. Uh, Jason, um, I, I see you're unmuted. I want to just talk about, I, I've known Jason for over a decade now, seems like forever. One of the first guys <laughs> I met when I was working down in, in Houston. Um, he's still looking as young and sharp as ever. But um, if you, if you're ever in Texas, you'll, you'll quickly find out that Jason's one of the foremost authorities on real estate investing. And even outside of Texas, I think one of the craziest things I remember, Jason, is I think the first time I spoke at one of your events, I'm originally from Seattle. You had some you had some people fly in from Seattle to Texas to and I I thought oh my God Jason's got a he's got a national appeal to him I've got people in my hometown coming out to fly fly and see Jason you do a lot of masterminds in education throughout the entire year is that right Yeah so uh, I just started like way back in the day I started buying houses back in 2013 and it was 2014. Right around the halfway through 2014, I had flipped about 50 houses, and um, I started doing videos in my truck in a private um, real estate mastermind Facebook group. So I get in my truck, and I would just like turn on the record button, and then I would upload it when I got to the office. And um, then people from all over the country just started following me, and I do this like a couple times a week. Sometimes I almost do it every day, and. Um, Anyway, so I started hosting events, and there were a bunch of folks up in Seattle, of all places. I We just, for whatever yeah. reason, a bunch of people up there, because that market, if you remember back then, that market was was up 
for a good five years, somewhere yeah. between two and three percent a month. It was insane. And so um we actually had some people from the from up there that joined our mastermind. And then it just so happened my brother moved up there at one point. So I'm flying back and forth. I'm hosting events up there because it's I mean, you know, Seattle is fantastic. I mean, it's just a great uh just a great market so uh and a great town so well i always have a ton of fun up there but yeah it's uh it was always one of my favorite places i don't know if i'd invest up there it is a tough tough market it's kind of like southern california which i'm gonna be in i'm leaving tomorrow for la but it's uh yeah it's much easier in houston i'll tell you that (laughs) i'll say this if you guys are interested in just like following somebody that provides some good golden nuggets just for free i mean jason's one of the guys i follow him on facebook i I love when you do the property tours live on facebook you and rob do a great job and that you've got the real estate i don't know if you guys still do the radio show but you guys are out there i don't even know how 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 you have time to find deals because you're you're on you're on socials all the time providing well i'll I'll tell you, we have reduced the podcast to maybe once or twice a week because we have gotten so busy with our funds and syndications and some of the other stuff that we're doing. Um, right now, if anybody's watching the multifamily market and no one's immune to it, I'll tell you that, uh, there's been some real challenges. So we are like, that is probably where I spent half of my time this year was just on our our funds and syndications and doing investor reporting. Like there is a lot of crazy stuff going on in the commercial real estate market right now. So we something had to give and it was it was unfortunately the radio show. <laughs> yeah, well, it happens, man. But uh, you you've got knowledge in almost any market. I think you've, you've done almost every type of deal. Everything from small single family to multifamily to commercial. You've got a huge. Um, what what is the uh, the big building that you've got out there that all the investors come to? Oh, it's a. And you know what? We just sold it too. Uh, the did. Texas okay. Real Estate Investment Center. We did. We yeah. just sold it about two months ago. So, uh-huh. but. It was a good concept. We're probably going to do another one. I don't know if we'll do one in Houston, but we're certainly looking at Vegas and some of the other markets. Um, but, um, too, right? Yeah, Maybe. it's a, it's actually a funny story. Uh, it's actually a funny story on why we sold it, but it's uh, that's that's for another webinar. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let, if you want, go ahead and share your screen and and jump into it, and I'll kind of monitor the chat for any questions, and I'll just I'll stop you as you go. But why don't you go ahead and okay. take it away? All right. Let's go all right so um for those of y'all who have been in real estate for a little while uh can you guys see my screen does that look good no i can't see it yet go ahead and uh oh here let me stop share sorry try now okay all right there you go should be able to see that right yep got it okay Hold on one second, a little button popped up. Okay. So uh, for those of y'all who have been uh, in the real estate industry for a while now, let's say since starting around 2010, one of the things you will notice is that there has been a huge problem with inventory. And it really started around 2010. And there's some reasons for that. And I can go through them real quick. Uh, Before 2010, and this had nothing to do with the great financial crisis, by the way. The real estate market really changed in 2010, and a lot of it has to do with demographics, demographics of people and our housing stock. So in the United States, uh, until before 2010, most people had relatively small homes. Uh, In fact, the house I'm in right now is one of my rental properties. I'm renovating my house in Spring Branch still, if you guys have followed along with that saga. But anyway, so this house right here, 1,500 square feet, built in the 80s, uh, 3-2, little 6,000 square foot lot, you know, nothing wild. However, my other house, the one that we're renovating in Spring Branch, is about 10 minutes from here, closer into town. That's a 1,200 square foot house, and I actually convert it from a 3-2 to a 2-2. So if you were, let's say, a young family back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you probably grew up in a house that's less than 1,500 square feet. So what ended up happening is as the kids get a little bit older, all of a sudden the house starts to feel a little bit smaller. So you live in a house five, six, seven, eight years, you get a bigger house. Kids get a little bit bigger, maybe getting close to high school age, you get another house, you get a little bit bigger house. So by the time the kids are ready and off to college or empty nesters, then folks are looking around and saying, well, maybe it's time to downsize. So 
um, that kind of ended that trend really started to, I don't want to say ended, but really tapered off in 2010. Uh, because a lot of times people's first home they bought, unless they had to relocate for a job was plenty big enough, you know, a, houses in the late eighties, late seventies, early eighties started to get bigger and bigger and bigger. It's actually called uh size or square foot inflation for real estate. And you guys can pull those charts up and look at them, look at build year, average square foot by build year and, you, and you'll see it. So if you don't have to move for a job relocation, then you really never sold your home unless you, you know, needed to move for school. To, I'm not saying everybody did that, but a significant number of Americans just stopped upgrading their home. That's, that's essentially what happened. And it all came to a head in about 2010. And in 2010, a lot of families looked around and said, I don't really need to get a smaller house and I don't really, or I don't need to get a bigger house. And when the kids leave, I don't really need to get a smaller house. So I'm just going to stay put here. Almost got it paid off. Just going to stay here. So what you started to see was a decline in inventory. While at the same time, since 2010, you started to see a slight increase in uh, new home purchases. Or I should say new home, new home buyers. So you had what's something called household formation. So Generation X, which I'm a very small portion of that, I, I think Nate is too. We're a really small generation in between the boomers and the millennials. Well, the millennials over the last couple of years have started to come of age and they've started buying houses and they are huge. They're almost as big as the millennials or as big as the boomers. So now they're buying houses. So what's that caused? A huge shortage of inventory in the marketplace. And what you could do even two or three years ago, you really can't do now. There's just not that many houses uh, on the market. If you don't believe me, go to any of the blogs out there. You go to NAR uh, here in Houston, HAR. Uh, the guys over at Calculated Risk, they're following inventory daily. Uh, Housing Wire, a uh, big fan of the folks over at Housing Wire. Uh, Logan Motoshami has a fantastic weekly tracker of it's called the housing i think it's called the housing market weekly tracker and what are they tracking they're actually tracking active and newly listed properties because there's a huge problem right now with the number of properties being on the market just to give you guys a uh just some more data before i get into this there are about 157 million americans working in the united states right now and there are less than a million homes for sale 157 million people working a million homes for sale. Now, some people say, well, not all those people can afford a home. You're absolutely right. Let's say only 10% can afford a home. That's 16 million people working, a million houses in the market. And then somebody goes, well, Jason, not all those people are going to buy a home. There's, you know, okay, great. Let's cut that number by 10 again. It's 1.7 million. 1.7 million people working that could buy a home, that could afford a home, all that, chasing after a million homes on the market. So keep that in mind when we start having this discussion about real estate markets and, you know, it's, it's hot again, real estate crash, right? There's a, I, I joked on social media, I said, it's 20, you know, the first day, literally clo the, the clock struck midnight and it was January 1st, 2024. And I posted on all my social media accounts, congratulations, guys. Those of you who predicted a real estate crash were wrong again. <laughs> You're like... 15 years in a row wrong. Anyway, and a lot of that has to do with the lack of inventory. So when I talk to my colleagues around the country who are real estate investors, one of the conversations we have is, hey, how's your business? And if they're being honest with me, a lot of their business has tapered a lot. If you were a big volume real estate investor, uh, just because there's not as many houses to buy anymore. So um, you've got to do more with less. That's what happens. So this is an example of how I'm doing more with less uh, right now. So the standard real estate model, and I don't care if you're commercial, residential, and I consider multifamily uh, residential. Uh, a lot of commercial real estate folks do as well. So just keep that in mind. But uh, the standard real estate model is four things, wholesaling, flipping, renting, and lending. And I'll tell you, most commercial real estate deals I've been involved in is really just a long-term flip. Uh, our syndications are exactly the same way. We don't hold on to these things forever. 
we buy them we buy the worst of the worst stuff we do a bunch of rehab on it and then we turn around in three four five years and then sell them so uh when you really get down to it most people are flippers most real estate investors are flippers they just do it on a longer uh on a longer timetable so what are the challenges to the standard model? Well, inventory, there's really nothing to buy. I drive around this town and this was a hot bed. I'll give you a, let me just give you a big disclaimer here. Houston is the largest real estate market in the country. There is no market that's bigger than Houston. There may be more expensive markets. There may be more competitive markets, but this is the largest one in the country. It's a hundred miles by a hundred miles. This is a 10,000 square mile marketplace. It is bigger than some states. That's how big this marketplace is. Um, that's one of the reasons why it's not in the Case-Shiller Index. So if you guys follow uh, real estate market trends, one of the metrics you probably follow is Case-Shiller. There's a composite 10 and a composite 20. I believe there's a composite 15 as well. But those are marketplaces that give you some sort of trend on where prices have gone and where they're heading uh, over some period of time, depending on how you analyze the data. Well, Case Shiller can't use Houston because the market's so big, it would skew their nationwide data. So that's why you won't see Houston a lot of it. You'll see Dallas-Fort Worth, Austin's always in there, and so is San Antonio. So just keep that in mind. Um, and prices are rapidly increasing. Even in an 8% mortgage world, I'm waiting for the HAR report to come out and the NER report uh, for the year-end review. My guess is... The properties that I buy, which in my marketplace are typically below the median home price, which is about $330,000, $350,000, they're probably up somewhere between 10 and 15%. So every year, my portfolio, just in appreciation, increases somewhere between 10 and 15%, even when mortgage rates were 8%. So keep that in mind. The inventory uh, has a lot to do with that. So how do we do more with less? Well, we can wholesale some and we can keep some. I'm not a big advocate of wholesaling. I don't think it's really a business model. It's really a tool to use when you are uh, when you get too many deals. Uh, flipping, holding and selling over two years. This is one of the things I have told flippers for years and I owned a flipping business. Hold on to those things as long as you can because just the, the short term tax implication is pretty brutal. In a lot of cases, it makes sense to buy it rehab it and just put a tenant in there for 12 months your, your rehab is going to take you three four months anyway um we have run into at least some of the cities we've uh we operate in where permits are taking an inordinate amount of time so a rehab that used to take you six seven months may take you a year and at that point you might might as well just throw a tenant in it for a year or do short-term rentals even if it just pays the note even if it just pays a note or pays a third or a half or three quarters of your closing or your holding costs, just the t difference between the tax treatment of an earned income flip, which could put you in dealer status with the IRS. So you're paying both sides of FICA and FUTA tax, almost 15% on top of your earned income versus two years from now, when you could be just paying long-term capital gains, it may be worth it for you to take the losses for the first two years uh, and then sell it. And then renting. Hey, Jason, can I yeah, just chime in just one thing? Because yeah. we, have, we have tons of UBIT fans on the workshop. Oh, okay. They, they love to talk about UBIT. But yeah. by, the, by, the end of the, by the end of this one, I think everyone's going to be an expert on UBIT. But I do want to touch on that because when you are buying property with a self in your self-directed IRA, that also is a factor too if mm -hmm. you're using debt to help you acquire the property. So mm -hmm. it's one thing we don't talk about very often, but – you can use a loan to help your IRA buy property and you can flip it, but you're you're going to be eaten up with taxes because IRAs pay taxes at trust rates. However, if you hold the property and sell it after a year and a day, your IRA gets treated long-term capital gains. So you're not having to pay the trust rate. So I just did, just want to tie in some self-IRA information. And I can't remember, what is the trust rate? Like 38%, 39 and a half, something like yeah, that? Yeah, well, it steepens out. Yeah, it's it's similar to our marginal income tax brackets. However, it steepens out at 37 and a half percent, like right. okay. $12,000. So you just get to the top very quickly. Now, this is only if you're using an IRA to full property that's got debt on it. So yeah. if you're if you're buying cash, you don't have to worry about it. If you're buying in a 401k, you don't have to worry about it. But it is something to consider 
that's a great point. If you're buying property debt leveraged in an IRA, maybe keep it a year and a day if you're planning on selling it. That way you pay long-term capital gains versus the trust bracket. Well, and, I, and I'll tell you the best way to do that too is like, let's say you got your IRA and you got a buddy over here and it's like, okay, look, you're going to either do the debt or you do it as a partnership deal. And it's so, it's so much simpler. Right. And then it's, cause I get that question all the time. Like, how do you do all this stuff? And you're like, there's plenty of money out there. You just got to find it. Then you could structure the deal. Like this is, this is just the real estate piece. Then there's the financing piece, which you can do just about anything with a self-directed IRA. Right. I mean, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's the beauty a of point. it. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a way around it. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but joint ventures don't, don't trigger you a bit, but We'll save that for another day. Yeah, that's a whole nother class. That's a whole 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 other class. class. Yeah. All right. (laughs) So, all right. Uh, So uh, holding and selling, let's say for two years, uh, uh, or let's let's talk about renting. So like I said, rent the property out, cash flow it for a little while. Um, Our our model here is, we call it the 10 house model, five years, 10 houses. And here's how we came up with that. We figured out that the top 1% of real estate investors in this country start at 10 houses. If you own 10 houses, not if you've owned, if you currently own 10 houses, you're in the top 1% of real estate investors. Now, that sounds like a lot if you're new. I can tell you if you've been doing this and you're, let's say you're a professional, that's not a lot of houses. To have 10 rental properties, not that big a deal. Um, but that's where kind of that that the ceiling is for real estate investors, where it, you know, it gets in kind of the top tier folks. So. We're big advocates of, hey, over ten, over five years, buy 20 houses, and at the end of five years, sell 10, and you could probably pay the other 10 off. And there is, uh, there's obviously not no risk, but there's a heck of a lot l- r- less risk in real estate if there's no debt on it. And so that's been our kind of our, our shtick, if you will, for a couple of years now. Uh, lending and partnering. Big fan of lending for cash flow, partnering for equity. We've done equity participation mortgages. We've done JVs. I've done all kinds of stuff, kind of like what we're, Nate and I were talking about. But if you're a traditional lender, you might want to look at, let's say you're just lending your your um, your IRA out as a uh, mortgage note, uh, deed of trust lending, that sort of thing. You may want to look at possibly partnering or doing some other things uh, so you can produce some equity there. Uh, so the solution is here, multiple options for the same deal and urban planning is allowing increased density. Now my colleagues here on the West coast are going to chime in. I'm sure because this has been hot for a couple of years now. And my joke is one of the reasons I'm going back and forth to California so much. My joke is whatever starts in California, five years later ends up in the rest of the country. So when I go to Southern California and I'm flying out tomorrow morning, doing a couple of events and then uh, a weekend class is uh, I always like to talk to them. Hey, what's hot here in real estate here? Oh, they're going to do this or this or this. And you go, like, okay, that'll be in Texas in a couple of years. Like, it's just a matter of time, right? So you can almost transport yourself in the future by just flying out to the West Coast. Seattle's another one of those markets, right? You just zip in and go, hey, what are you guys doing in real estate? And they tell you, you go, ooh, and then you go back to, you know, uh, flyover country, if you will, um, like in Texas. So ADUs have been very popular. These are accessory dwelling units. They're very popular in California. They're just now becoming in trend or on trend here in Houston. And I'll talk about that here in a minute. And also splitting off lots and either doing new construction on those lots or selling the lots. So uh, what is an ADU? This is a basic uh, graphic of an, uh, of an accessory dwelling unit. It's just an extra unit on a single family piece of property. Uh, so the internal one on the upper left there, that's an extra floor or maybe a basement. You start writing that out. Upper right is uh, where it's attached to the actual property. There's an additional unit there or the detached down there at the bottom uh, where there's an extra unit uh, on that piece of land. Now, I will tell you this. In Texas, we have something called the Texas multifamily. And that is these are properties that are, let's say I've got a 32 unit in Baytown, Texas right now, and it's all triplexes. It's like eight buildings, but it's all a bunch of little triplexes on a on a big piece of property. That's technically considered multifamily. So we're not talking about that. We're talking about kind of individual lots uh, for these units. And we'll show you what that looks like. This just got passed in Houston, Texas in November of 23. They've been talking about this for years. I've been predicting this for years because I'd fly to California and then I'd come back and go, ADUs are here. And then everybody would go, what's an ADU? I don't know what that is. And I'm like, 
it's this. It's where you take a lot. And uh, in Texas, for the most I should say in Texas, in Houston, for the most part, our lot minimums are about 5,000 square feet. And so what this allows us to do is take a, a lot and then chop it up into uh, into units where we can put like larger, like uh, well, a higher density. And so you can see those in the bottom here, starting with the bottom left, that's alley access. So essentially there's a little alley in the back. It's just for that lot. It's not an alley, it goes across multiple lots, it's just for that lot where you can drop two units in. You have a shared driveway. We see that in like um, in Edo, if you guys are familiar with Edo and the Heights in Houston. Courtyard development. We don't see a lot of these in Houston. Uh, but this next one, flag lots. Like you used to not be able to do flag lots. So flag lot is just where like there's the, the lot is bifurcated across this L. So one lot is an L and the other one's kind of like this little box. Uh, shared driveway, but a kind of a different shared driveway uh arrangement uh front load individual driveway um this is another shared driveway that just goes down the sides and then here's a shared driveway rear uh with corner access so uh this has been really helpful the city of houston's kind of jumped ahead of these things and said hey guys we got a housing uh we got a housing problem here and the only way to solve it is through alternative methods like this so You've got a couple of options here. You found a perfect piece of property that you may be able to do this stuff with. So what are you going to do? You're going to buy a property that needs substantial rehab, then build an ADU. Or you buy a property, demo the ex existing structure, and then build multiple units. Or you buy the property, split the lots, and build. And I'm going to show you a property I bought in Corpus Christi, Texas. We do a bunch of business down there. We are mostly in Houston and Corpus. I want to say about 40% of our portfolio is down in Corpus Christi. And uh, this was on the market. It was on MLS. It's an acre and a half, and it's sat forever. And uh, I just walked in and said, uh, funny story. So we call the seller. We said, hey, seller, um, what do you guys want for this thing? I think it was on the market for, I don't know, 100, 110. I can't even remember what the number was. I think I'm all in at 165 at this point. And he said, well, here's the deal. Um, I won this, or I got this property from the original owner as payment for gambling debt. And I was like, I just said, okay. So... Uh, I said, as long as you got clear title, I don't care how you got the thing, right? So evidently, the guy uh, gave it to him for gambling debt. When I first went to walk the property, the existing structure on there, I had a warrant out for the uh, previous owner's arrest. It was pretty funny. So in any case, uh, this was the property. That's the lot as it sits. This is what it looks like uh, from an aerial view. That's the existing structure there. Uh, these are no longer there. They're just concrete pads. This is a dry creek in the back. And I have a lot of people ask me, like, especially with the flood concern down here in the south, uh, most properties that flood are actually not in a flood zone. But one of the telltale signs that you might be close to a flood zone or have a potential for for flooding is if this thing has water in it. This is actually a dry creek bed. Um, so it's really not much of a flood risk. And this is built up. So this is the entire, this is the, uh, you can see the greenery here. That's actually where it drains. Uh, the reason this is really dry is because the local kids are ripping their four wheelers up and down this uh, creek bed. So in any case, a little driveway here, but this is the entire lot. Um, so I called my guy, I actually just texted him. His name is Carlos the Replotter. And I have used Carlos for years now. And what Carlos does is replot lots. He knows what the code is and what we can and can't get away with. Now, my original thought for this property was, uh, and I think I bought it for like 195 or 110, some, some number like that. Like I said, I've been for like 165. But uh, I called Carlos up and I said, hey, can we demo the house? And I looked at... Um, you know, the mobile home park density for the city of Corpus Christi. And I think I can fit like 17 mobile homes, like single wides on this lot. And so he calls the city up and this is what the city said. He said, you know, you boys can ask to have a mobile home park put in, but I'm not sure you'll ever be approved for it. So that was a nice way of saying it ain't going to happen. <laughs> now, 
legally can we really pressure them and all i mean we could try they're just going to make your life miserable so there are rules that are on the books you know in some of these municipalities and then there are what you can actually get approved so carlos came back to me said hey man what do you want to do i said i you know why don't you call him and ask him and see if what other things we can do and he said okay so he drew this up sent it to the city and the city said uh, you know, five lots here. We think we can, we're cool with that. So this is the creek bed right here. You can see that's why it's angled real squirrely. That's the actual creek bed right there. That's the existing home. Uh, this is, this is lot one, two, three, four, five. So we got five lots here. Uh, these are the values of just the lots. Now I don't have lot number four on here because that one has the house on it. So we went and ran comps. I said, well, if we subdivide these lots, what would they be worth? And the largest lot, which is lot one, it's the one on the far right, worth about 85 grand. And then 57, 54, 47. Now, mind you, after I renovated the house on lot four, I'm all in for $165,000. So just the lots alone are worth 244 grand. So this is already a home run of a deal. Already a home run of a deal. Now, here's the problem. Most people passed on this deal. In, in fact, I'll, I'll tell you this. Uh, in our mastermind group, one of, the, uh, one of the things we do in our mastermind is we send our deals out to the mastermind first. Say, hey, guys, you get right of first refusal. If you want it, cool. If not, we'll buy it. Everyone passed on this deal. So one of my favorite things about doing case studies is I kind of rub their nose in the stuff they should have bought. <laughs> and this is one of them. Um, in any case, so you could sell these lots and just have a free and clear house. I mean, that's that's not a bad deal. Oh, by the way, let me go through the rest of the deal. And I'll walk you through the whole thing. Uh, the house on McCain, it's a 2-2, rents for about $1,400 a month, values about $165,000, which is about what I'm into it for. Uh, Purchase price, price plus rehab was 165K. I got a private loan through 2025. Now, the lending on these things is a little squirrely. So what will happen is if you go to a traditional bank for financing, they will they will encumber the entire property. So uh, that may uh, goof up your exit strategy, and I'll explain that here in a little bit. But once you start subdividing these lots, that loan attaches to all of them. So I have a private loan in place. Uh, and uh, we're pretty good there. Uh, I actually looked at maybe owner financing this thing with $100,000 down. So some an investor came to me and said, hey, Jason, would you sell this thing? And I'm like, sure, I'd sell it to you for two sixty five. dollars I mean, the lots are worth two forty four. dollars Do dollars down. You could rent the house. Cash remaining in the deal after you paid the loan off, you'd only have about $20,000 left in the deal. So that's certainly a possibility. And that's something I left out there for uh, some real estate investors. However, what you could do is build some new homes and then sell it. So let's say purchase price is 265 grand. You build four fa single family homes. You can build three twos there at about a hundred dollars a foot. So that's $150,000 per house. The ARV for a new build there is about $300,000. So you'd be creating $150,000 in equity on each one of these properties that you put up. That would give you a six hundred thousand dollar net profit uh maybe i should say gross profit because you're gonna have selling expenses carrying costs that sort of thing uh you pay off the existing home loan and retain about four hundred thirty five thousand dollars in cash with one house free and clear uh this is the strategy i'm going to employ like i said i've got my properties are always for sale like if they're always for sale, I got beach houses right now. My beach houses are always for sale. Like everything's for sale. I'm not in love with any of these houses. The only house I really love is my house. I'm trying to get done in spring branch and I've got some offers out on lake houses. Other than that, everything is for sale at any time. Um, I actually bought these things for $165,000. So if I were to take the 165 K keep the deal, I'd then build four houses. I could build them for $150,000 each. Now they're new builds. They'd be three twos, 1500 square feet. They rent for 2,200 a month. So if you include, uh, actually I need to change that number because I had that set up for 265, but 
It would cost me about $600,000 plus the $165,000 cost me $765,000 to have four homes plus the existing home purchased and rehabbed. I'd have about a million and a half in equity. Gross rents are about $10,000 a month. Uh, don't worry, when we get to the end of this presentation, I have an Excel spreadsheet that has all this stuff in here. So you don't have to remember these numbers. However, here's the number you do have to remember. If you rehab these, if you rehab the existing house and then you build four houses, you'll have so much equity, you will have no money in the deal after you refinance at the end of construction. And you'll have $1.4 million in equity. All right, let me show you the rest of the deal. But wait, there's more. And that's the whole point of this presentation. The city will allow ADUs. So let me show you what Corpus Christi allows as an ADU. Guys, give me one second. I got to move some stuff around. This is Corpus Christi's zoning rules. Corpus Christi, Texas, offers a permit expedited service. Oh, that's interesting. An expedited service. By the way, when I first started investing in Corpus Christi, I met with the folks at Section 8, the housing office there. Really nice guy, runs the whole shop. He runs it for three counties there. And he said, Jason, do you know how many families we have waiting for housing in the city of Corpus Christi? I said, I do not. He said, we have a waiting list of over 4,000 families. So the city, and this is not just uh, a Section 8 uh, deal alone, but the city is very interested in getting really nice housing for people. So they have an expedited permit service for accessory dwelling units. Why? Because they absolutely need to get more people in the city. It's growing super fast. If you guys are paying attention, Robstown, which is right outside of Corpus Christi, is where they're building the new lithium refining facility for Tesla. So. Uh, just to give you kind of a an idea of what's going on, <laughs> Tesla's big facility is in Austin, Texas. Boca Chica is in the valley of Texas. Between Boca Chica and Tesla, so Boca Chica is SpaceX. They're also going to build the first spaceport in the world there. And Tesla is in Austin. In the middle of there is this little place called Corpus Christi. It's the second largest port uh, in Texas huge oil and gas it's the uh second most uh, uh second highest in tourism san antonio being the first so it's a, a little economic hotbed it's a sleepy little city so here's the interesting thing i can put in adus so we had a conversation with the city and uh my guy carlos the replotter called and said hey my client jason um he doesn't want to do the mobile homes because I don't think you guys would really approve it. And they were like, mm, that's probably a good idea. And then he said, well, but he wants to put more than just single family houses. And so the guy I talked to at the city said, tell you what, why don't you guys put single family houses on each one of those lots and then we'll let you build a garage apartment. And we said, um, oh, I think we can do that. So I, I actually just texted him now. I said, hey, can you, because I hadn't gotten an update since December. I said, hey, can you give me an update on where we're at with the Corpus Christi deal? And he said, um, we're closed today, but I'll have an update tomorrow. But they just asked for a handful of corrections right there in the middle of December. So he said, I just haven't asked for an update yet. Okay, let me show you guys some numbers, because let's be honest, none of this really matters without some numbers. If you took the existing house and you rehabbed it, purchase plus rehab is about $165,000. That includes the land and the replot. My replot runs about 15,000 bucks. We could build four more houses, a house on lot one, two, three, and five. The existing house is on lot four. Here's your estimated taxes, insurance, gross rents. Here's your cash flow. So if you paid cash for this stuff, you'd be out of pocket about $765,000 and you're your net cash flow would be about $92,000 a year. By the way, one of my big sticklers whenever people do these presentations is I always like to ask, is it gross or net? Like gross or net, man? Give me that. Like, I'm cool talking about numbers. Just tell me, is it gross or net? So 
Gross would be one hundred twenty-two thousand dollars a year, about ten grand a month. Net is about ninety-two four. This is our estimated ARV. Those houses are worth three hundred thousand dollars all day, all day long. That two two is worth about one sixty-five. So we've created about one point three six five million in equity. Here is my big. Here's another thing I, I need you guys to know. I own multifamily. I own commercial office buildings. I have owned, I own storage. In fact, we're doing a storage uh, PPM thing right now. Um, and I can tell you out of everything I've owned, everything I've owned, I make the absolute most amount of money with the least amount of work in single family. Also the least about a legal risk too. Like when you start doing PP, when you start doing private placement memorandums, you start bringing in partners and all that stuff, you're taking a lot more legal risk. Single family houses is, I, I will say this, it's the second easiest way to make money in real estate. The number one easiest way to make real estate is mortgage notes, lending your money to somebody like me. Like that is the easiest thing to do. In fact, we do it. We lend money to folks all the time, whether in our mastermind group or friends that are doing deals, you know, we've got IRA, we're doing all kinds of stuff. So that's the easiest way to make money. The second easiest way to make money is doing something like this. So now don't get me wrong. Is it completely easy? No. I'm going to have to go down to Corpus Christi. It's about two and a half hours from Houston. It's beautiful down there. I got this close to buying a house on the bay. It was a beautiful house, and I just got outbid the last minute. So my hope was I was going to start doing this construction project, and then I'd just be like, well, you know, I tell my business partner, you know, I'm going to have to be down here for like a week or two. You know, the fishing's good. You know, the dock is right there. It's beautiful. Anyway, so uh, you're going to – so for me, I'm going to have to be down there – probably a week or so a month, you know, a couple of times. It's a, it's the plane flight Southwest, $120, I think round trip, maybe it's $200 round trip. So I can fly down there, have one of our guys pick me up at the airport or, you know, just Uber over there. It's not far. Right. Anyway. So there's going to be some work involved here. That's my point. Uh, this is the equity right here. Uh, ARV one, three, six, five equity, about six, uh, 600 grand. That's your return on equity. This is your cash flow, the whole portfolio. That's your uh, cash on cash return free and clear. By the way, I dropped the mortgage in here. So there's enough equity in this thing. I mean, look at it. You're, you have 44% equity in here. I, I wouldn't do a cash out refi. You can, if you want, but I wouldn't do a cash out refi. I'd leave all that equity in there. That's another thing. I'm not a big like cash out, take a bunch of money out kind of guy. Um, I've always been a big fan of like, just let the appreciation ride. And so um, in any case, if you were to put a mortgage on this, you could refinance out 100%. Let's say you use private money to do the construction, private money to buy the house, all that stuff. Uh, you could do a rate and term refi. Uh, your mortgage would be about 5,000 bucks a month. Um, if that's at 7%, as these rates start to go down, obviously it'd be more. Um, let me put it at 8% because that that's probably a little more relevant to what's going on today. Your cash flow would be about $25,000 a year. No money in the deal. $600,000 in equity. That, that's not bad. That's today. By the way, this market, if you guys want me to pull the data up, I think this market appreciated 20% last year. Let me look. Uh, Corpus Christi. Uh, what do they call their CCR? I think it's this. Give me a second here and I'll pull it up. Oh, nope. That's, uh, make a police report. Um, CC. Here it is. Doing, there you go. As you're doing that, Jason, I just want to remind people, if you guys have questions, just type them into the Q&A box. This is great stuff, Jason. I already got some, some notes. I love the subdividing lot. I kind of typed into the, uh, the chat there, I had a client once partner her Roth IRA with her granddaughter's Roth IRA this mm -hmm. is about eight, nine years ago. They bought a piece of land outside of Houston mm -hmm. um, and subdivided the land, sold off, the, sold off the lot, individual lots. But the granddaughter's Roth IRA started at five grand. And I think in five years through that whole process was worth $75,000. Mm -hmm. yeah. But the granddaughter was nine years old. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, great job, grandma. I, we, I wish we all could have grandparents like that. But um, when you 
talked about subdividing the lots, I immediately thought back to her deal. It's and there's a bunch of these out there. It's just now the pain. I'll tell you the pain point in this whole thing. It's going to cost you 10, 15, 20 grand, depending on how big the project is, right? Just to do a subdivide. And then you got to wait. It takes forever. Like I've been on this project like six months now. And I, and I know the construction is going to take me two years. I mean, don't, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be a pain. Like, it's just, that's real estate investing. If you don't want to do that, it's fine. Just lend your money to somebody that does that. Right. But like you said, it takes a couple of years. You know, yeah. it's a, I, I think you've said this, I've heard you say this from stage and it's completely true. It's, it's not timing the market. It's time in the market. So you just got to get in the market. But anyway, so I, always, I always say that with self-directed IRAs, like your deals in your IRA don't have to be the same as the deals that put food on the table. So oftentimes right, yeah. those a lot real different. So this deal, I remember took a couple of years. It wasn't a deal she wanted to do outside of the IRA because it didn't really, you know, feed her that year, but it was a great deal that profited in five years. So just put it on the shelf in a Roth. Yeah. So many deals work better in a Roth IRA than they do personally and vice versa, I think. Yeah. When you guys had me out at uh, Alt Asset Conference, I think Matt was telling a story about some something he had like randomly threw into his Roth in Chicago. It was like some single family house. And he was like, well, maybe I ought to sell it. And then they looked at the equity. They were like, nope, just let it ride. Just like, yeah. just let it go. You got almost nothing into it. Who cares? Just like, let it ride. And then we'll cash out at some point in the future. Yeah. Time is on your friend. Usually in, in with your, with your IRAs, depending on how old you are, obviously, but yeah. I, you know, I've said this, uh, relationships like real estate, time heals all wounds <laughs> for the most part. Right. So, yeah. but, um, in any case, so here's the, here's the, uh, Corpus Christi housing report, uh, median home price is up 7%. So conservatively, this $300,000 number is going to be up 7%. Actually this 1.365 number is going to be up 7% in a year. So you can add another, oh, what's that? Uh, that'd be 210, let's see, uh, 21, 20, 40, 80. You can add another $100,000 in equity in a year. Now you're at 700 grand in equity. So in any case, these things are, it's just my point. They're, uh, the equity's going up. Okay, so that's scenario one right here. This is scenario one. We'll fix the existing house, and um, and then we're gonna build these single family three two fifteen hundreds. Or this scenario is let's demo the house. Let's just demolish it. I've already renovated it, but let's just demolish the house. And now we've got five brand new builds. So if you spread that cost of the of the hundred sixty five thousand dollars of the land and the existing house. And the $150,000 per house construction comes out to about 183 per. So you'll see your return is just a little bit lower. It's a little bit lower because you got to spread that cost out. Uh, this is adding an ADU. So let me explain what's going on here. This is if you were to take that house, add an AD, actually demo the house, and build that garage apartment. I think it would take, it would cost about $233,000 to build a 1500 square foot house. And then a garage apartment, about 750 square feet, less than somewhere between 700 and 1100 square feet, a little two one. Your rent goes up substantially. You're at about $1,000 a month on the garage apartment, plus the $2,200 a month for the, um, for the main house. That's your gross cash flow, $162,000. I'm sorry, that's, uh, that is your net cash flow if you paid cash for all this stuff, $162,000 a year. Uh, I think these things would easily be worth $400,000. It's just that's the price per square foot out there and the value would be just through the roof. So now you've got about $835,000 in equity. Gives you about a 14% cash on cash return. Uh, yes, you read that right. That's $59,000 a year. $5,000 a month in net cash flow with a mortgage and you have no money in the deal. Uh, you could also, instead of demoing that house, you could just do the ADU on the four existing houses that run you about 200,000 bucks. You get about $55,000 
a year in net cash flow. So what I'm likely to do, and this is what I'm texting back and forth with Carlos, I've got my uh, architect. I don't know when he's supposed to, he's either calling me today or tomorrow. I just told him to text me and we're going to chat on the phone and I'm going to have him put together some drawings for five of these properties. In fact, they're all going to be the same. I mean, truth be told, maybe they'll have a little bit different elevation, but they're going to be value engineered. And um, I'm going to do the construction on all four houses. And then on the existing house, then I'll kind of decide if I want to demo it, if I want to rehab it, maybe when the other ones start to get finished, then I'll do the other one. So we'll just see there. But um, that's kind of the plan. So this is, like I said, you got multiple exit strategies. And, or you could do the lazy method here. I'm all in for 165. I could sell the lots for almost for $240,000, put $20,000, $30,000 in my pocket and pay off the house. And it would cash flow 12, 1300 bucks a month. So that is, uh, that is the strategies that I am looking at. Uh, I guess I'll go through the questions here. Or how do you want to do this, uh, Nate? Do you want to read the questions to me or do you want me to read them? How do well, you all want to I, do these? I've got some questions. I'm still encouraging people to ask some questions. We've got some good comments in the in the chat section. Um, let me ask you this from your experience, because I know Houston's a little bit more lenient when it comes to zoning and, and, and wh where does ADUs fall into that? Are people going to have a hard time trying to build ADUs in, in their areas? Which kind of your experience um, comparing Houston to some other territories? So in Houston, they just approved all this ADU stuff. And the way Houston had approached it was the way they approach it is, hey, our lot minimum for the, for most places, about 5,000 square feet. And they just approved, um, they just approved the ADU provision in November. So they've been working on it for about a year, if I were to get a year or two. Um, and it, as long as it's, well, let me put it this way. Houston's always allowed you to do garage apartments. Like, hey, throw now some HOAs won't. Now you got that's you know, there's there's no zoning here, but there are HOAs. And the HOAs are the gorilla in the room, right? I don't think you're gonna get HOAs signing up for ADUs. I, I just don't don't see that uh happening anytime soon. But the city of Houston's gonna allow it. So um, as long as they've codified it, like it's in code, it's in law. I mean. You know, it's they're, they're pretty oh, and, easy. And Margaret, with. Margaret on the on the um, workshop, she said that Nevada, she's in Nevada, they're starting to address ADUs too. So I, I think you're right. Wood. This is it's coming. Nevada is really interesting because you know Vegas really drives Nevada, right? Yeah. <laughs> and a lot of people don't know Vegas is landlocked. Like mm -hmm. it's all Bureau of Land Management land all around it, or Department of Defense. Like you can't. There's no everyone like oh the desert. You just keep expanding the desert. No, dude, it's a place is pretty much locked up with exception to what, whatever that road is. You guys come in uh, from Vegas, but it's pretty uh, Vegas is about to get real expensive. There's just not very, very many places to go. Uh, we have a question here. Could, could you split into 10 lots? Sounds like a lot of lots, but. Uh, so the way the, the law is in Corpus, I tried to split them into smaller lots but we have to start building flag lots and some of that other stuff. They won't allow that yet, but Houston would. Uh, now we also run into stormwater issues when you start to get beyond like an acre and a half, two acres, actually it's like two to five acres. And then when you get above five acres, there's some other stormwater stuff. So we start to run into some issues here in Texas. It's really not that big a deal for these little residential lots. Uh, but uh, I couldn't split it anything smaller. They wouldn't let us do it. They were like, hey, this is the smallest. We'll let you do it. And I'm like, well, if it's already a really great deal, we're not going to push the city, right? right. <laughs> it's, well, but Lola, I, have, Lola. I have them looking at a really big plot of land right now that we, and I, and, and we've got a email in and a phone call into the city about this next project. So we'll, we'll see that maybe it'll let us do uh, smaller ones. So yeah, the craziest thing about Houston, because I lived there for 10 years, it's wild how there's st still so much land to be built on. I mean, it's the yeah. third largest city in the country, but there's still undeveloped land in the center of town. Yeah, in the it's it's wild. You know, I was down in uh Galveston um for my kids cheer competition. So if you guys know what that world is like, so I was just dropping some stuff off and then I had to go do some work stuff, and it amazed me in galveston on the strand like on the uh it there's still all this land and it's it's kind of wild to watch now i will tell you this 
that land is an arm and a leg. That's the only the only challenge, right? It's it's pretty pricey stuff. So, yeah, Lola from California, she says um, an HOA cannot prevent you from building an ADU if you meet the setbacks. That that's interesting. I don't I don't know if you've yeah, it's got to be a California thing. There, the, the HOAs here are like the 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 strongest states for HOAs and and uh, POAs and that sort of thing is Florida and and Texas. Florida has some really crazy laws, but I can't imagine uh, state law superseding eight, that that sort of thing. That's probably a California thing. Yeah, um, we got an anonymous question here, and, and I'm assuming this is pertaining to your property. Good to know. But he said, uh, "Have you penciled out multifamily for this?" Uh, I have. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense, and I'll tell you why. Uh, there's this. I kind of get what the gurus teach. Like the gurus teach. If you got more units, rent goes up $50 a unit. It's X number, multiplier, cap rate, all that makes total sense. But I'm telling you, there's more equity in single family. And, and the other challenge is, is like, if I'm going to build a 10 or 15 unit, you start to run into parking issues. You run into, there's some storm, there's all, there's uh, all sorts of other issues that you run into. If you're going to build multifamily, build something big. You know, if you're going to do that commercial stuff, do something big big and uh and it makes sense there's a reason so i'm in and out of la all the time i'm here the all i'm uh, you know i just we were in phoenix not so long like there is a reason most multifamily doesn't matter where you go looks the same and it's three stories yeah if if you were if you go anywhere i guarantee you nate in your town you drive around all the new all the brand new Multifamily is three stories. Now, why is that? Because when you get above three stories, it's considered a high rise. And now you're doing a whole lot more fire protection, egress, all that stuff. It gets really expensive. So if you're going to do a high rise, what are you going to do a high rise? You're not going to do a four story. You're going to do a 15 story. So a lot of these zoning and building laws kind of pigeonhole you into like what you can actually build. And, and that's why you don't see somebody building a 10 unit. I know a guy right now in our mastermind group that's building like a 15 unit apartment complex. I'm like, bro, I don't know why you're doing that. Like that is, it's, it's going to be, it's tough. And they're running because they're going to, they're, um, they are given the same level of scrutiny as if you were building a 150 unit, three story, you know, apartment complex. So yeah, it's just not worth it. This makes a lot more. This is a lot easier. Jason, I'm gonna I'm gonna transition to some slides of mine. But while you mentioned that, can you tell people about your masterminds? Like, how can people get more involved in that and get more education out from you outside of this? Yeah, just uh, shoot me an email, Jason at mrtxre.com. Jason at mrtxre.com. If you're interested in what we're doing, uh, we invest in Texas. That's what our mastermind does. Uh, we are. We do real estate education, but we're a lot more about doing. So when folks join our group, uh, the expectation is you're going to start buying real estate. You know, we don't uh, we don't let anybody flounder around. I'm not sure. No, nope, no. Nope. You join this group, you are buying real estate. So uh, a, we're a group of doers. From what I know, it's selective. You have to meet certain it is, criteria. It is. We only have about a. Our cap is about a hundred people uh, a year. Uh, we run about 70 to 80. Our renewal rate is something like 85%. It's it's wild. So um, most folks stay in for a couple of years. Uh, Jason, I could type it in here, guys. Let's see. Someone yeah. asked me in the chat. Yeah, go ahead and type that in. And then we have another question from Caroline. She said, what's the best way to find which states allow land splitting or replotting? Oh, they all do. Um, they, they absolutely all do the, the challenge. Here's the hard part of this strategy. It, let me back up a second. I, the biggest problem you guys will run into in your real estate investing career is what is it you're trying to accomplish? That's the biggest problem. I've been teaching real estate since 16 and that's the biggest problem. So folks will say, well, I'm just going to go find, I have this one strategy and I'm going to go do this one deal in Sacramento. And I'm like, okay, well, do you have a lot of real estate in Sacramento? No, but now I'm looking at this deal in Albuquerque. I'm like, you got to learn a whole new set of laws. You got to, what I would do is I would pick a market and stay there. Uh, yeah. The reason I know how to do this is because I've been doing Corpus Christi for the last five years. Cause I can pick up the phone. I can talk to a guy that does replotting in Texas and I can pick up the phone and call somebody who's an expert in this or an expert in that, but you're not going to know that 
unless you're really working in that marketplace. And I get it there, you know, the whole, the whole like network is your net worth. I understand all that, but you really build that network as you progress through your career. So I'd figure out, Hey, what am I trying to accomplish? And then go find a place. Every place will allow this. I mean, they do it in Southern California. They do it in New York. They do it. I mean, they do it everywhere. It's just, um, where is a, where's the place that's going to be, that's going to meet your goals. The harder part is going to be the regulatory hurdles, you know, finding the person that does the replotting and then the construction. But I firmly believe the hardest thing in this business is one construction and two property management. Everything else is easy. Those are the two hardest things. If you've done a lot of real estate, you'll, you'll, you'll probably agree with that. I mean, you know, you know, Eddie here in Houston, it's one of the things he and I talk about all the time. He said, this is the hardest thing in this business. It's, yeah. it's not finding a deal. It's not finding the money. It's one construction, two property management. Bar well, one none. thing I'll commend, yeah. One thing I'll commend you and, and Eddie on, if you guys don't know Eddie Gant, he's a big investor out there in, in Texas as well. Is is you guys have kind of stuck to what you know, and that's kind of what I tell everybody who has a self directed IRA is invest in what you're comfortable with, and you've always been comfortable with single family. You've done other things, but like you said, like you understand the rules with single family, you understand the legal implications. You've got you've got people that can that can manage your you know your deals or, or do what you want to do, but you you invest in what you are more comfortable with and not just what, cause you go online, everyone's oh, multifamily, this multifamily, that you have to be a multifamily. You've always been a guy like, nah, I kind of like single family. Yeah. And you know, and like I said, I've gone out and bought stuff. So my joke is with other asset classes, like when we bought the office building and the self storage and all that, uh, my joke internally in our office is I buy it so cheap. I can't even screw it up. So when you're doing your first one, especially these commercial deals, because they can get ugly fast. Um, when you get into these deals, like just get them really, really cheap when you're starting out. Uh, but single family, I'm, and here's the other reality. There is not enough commercial real estate, self-storage, apartments, all that other stuff in the entire country to, to really make as many investors wealthy as they think they should be. It. I mean, I'm in a neighborhood right here. I, I love this little cove. I buy rental properties right here. I think it's less than 50 houses. Yeah. And I can easily buy 10 over the next couple of years just right here. You know, that's it's hard to scale sometimes some of this big multifamily stuff. So, Well, just as a reminder, I've got a slide up here for anybody that is not familiar with the program. Everything that Jason's basically gone over as far as buying real estate, you can do that in a self-directed retirement plan. You either, you either can do it actively where you're finding your own deals and you're running those investments through directed IRA, your IRA custodian, but you can use any of the plans here on the screen. And the beautiful part about these plans is if you do it right, you pay zero taxes on any of the gains. Jason had mentioned a couple different times, which I'm a, I'm a big proponent on, is if you're not familiar or you don't want to be the active part, well, then look for someone where you can be the passive part. You can you can make money in real estate without even owning real estate. I, I All of my investments right now in my IRAs are notes, just deeds of trust. It's secured by property. Um, I get interest payments from real estate investors, so I don't have to do the legwork. I don't have to deal with toilets and tenants. Somebody way better equipped than I am is dealing with all those problems, but that's how I get my money off the sidelines and invested in real estate is through notes. But again, no matter what type of investing strategy you use, whether it's active, whether it's passive, whether you do joint ventures, your IRA or the, those seven types of plans there can all be the owner or the participant in that investment. You just got to work those investments through us. I always challenge people to just start doing one deal. Do one deal a year. I had a client take $70,000 from an old 401k. He just did one deal a year for five years. And that IRA is now not $70,000, but it's a $4 million Roth IRA, just using creative strategies, creative techniques that Jason's familiar with, buying property subject to. There's all types of great strategies. And I'll tell you what, Jason opened my eyes to a lot of things I hadn't even really thought about ADUs until now, but I'm sure I'm just going to see it everywhere. <laughs> my phone's probably listening, so I'm going to get all sorts of advertisements and videos on ADUs, I'm you, sure. You know, what's, you know what's so funny is... Uh... It's kind of like, you know, you buy a new car and then you're like, man, I, you know, buy the new car. You like really like it. And then you look around and everyone has that same car. It's like, once you start looking for it, you'll, you'll find it. So well, and somehow your phone knows what, what you're thinking of or talking about. So it's, a, it's always peeping uh, on us. So, uh, sure it's going to start spitting some stuff out to me. 
So uh, Mr. Roy here says, can ADUs be both attached and detached? From a technical definition, yes, but it also depends on what the city is going to allow you to do. So they just told us you can have a detached garage, attached, whatever. It doesn't matter. You just have a little apartment up there. Yeah, well, the diagram helps. So if you guys want the recording, just uh, by tomorrow, you guys will get a follow-up email if you registered, if you're watching this with the recording. So you can go back and rewatch that. Um, I do want to kind of wrap it up. I know we got a little bit over time, but it was great information. If you guys want to open a self-directed IRA and start investing in real estate, start using some of these strategies that Jason helped uh, explain today, uh, just set up a call with me. Use that code RYR100. We give you $100 off every type of self-directed plan. As long as you use that code, if you want to talk specifically to me on how the self-directed IRA works, just scan that QR code and book a call with me. And I want to make sure that you guys know, we have now announced our next self-directed IRA summit, which hopefully Jason is going to be a part of. I just told him about it. I'll be there. <laughs> I'll so be there. This is going to be in Dallas, April 19th and 20th. It's a one day event. The 19th is just a welcome reception. The 20th, we go all day, full-fledged self-directed IRAs and how they can be used to invest in alternative assets like real estate. We've got expert panels. We've got a real estate panel that Jason's going to be on. We've got an alternative asset panel. We have a we have a kick butt casino night party at the end of the evening on the 20th. So it's not only going to be educational, but it's going to be fun. We literally just had the website go live this weekend. So if you guys are interested in buying tickets, early bird, we've got early bird Tickets, 50 bucks off any ticket you buy, VIP, virtual, or GA, um, and that's going to expire at the end of this month. So grab your tickets now. There's a limited there's a limited amount of space. This is going to be at the Westin Galleria in Dallas, April 19th and 20th. Great, great venue. Our last one in Raleigh was, was amazing. We had a ton of people come out there. Watch the... Um, We've got some testimonials on the website as well. So go ahead and watch the testimonials, see what other people thought about it. But jump to sdirasummit.com and grab your tickets before they're gone and grab that $50 off. Even VIP guys, VIP were the hottest sellers at last event. VIP sold out before anything else. And we didn't even give discounts on that. So right now we've got $50 yeah. discounts but on if I can tell you guys anything, any of these sorts of events like this, always buy the VIP. It's always worth it. The networking's great. You get some one-on-one -on -one time with folks. It's the VIP is always the best. Awesome. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, again, Jason, just uh, where can where can people find out more information? Should they go to the website? Should they just email yeah. you? You can go to mrtxre.com or you guys can shoot me an email. We're doing a ton of projects. So if you guys are interested in doing some passive investing, we can do that or the mastermind or just uh, if you type in Texas real estate mastermind, all of our videos will come up. We have a ton of videos, ton of content on YouTube and Spotify and iTunes and all that Texas real estate mastermind and y'all can check us out there. Masterminds are great too, because it's very different than some events where I will just say you get a lot of tire kickers. There's no tire kickers at your event. They're all no. people that are actively doing deals or they're setting themselves up to do do more deals. Yeah, we're a we're a doing group. There's yeah. no uh there's no hiding. Let me put it that way. No. You're not gonna you can't get in there and just learn all the time. You learn by doing. That's our but big the thing. best yeah. by doing. The best thing about being in those groups, especially if you've got a self-directed IRA, is if you want to find deals, um, submerge yourself with a group that are doers. That's the easiest way to find deals. Oh, we're always, we're lending back and forth to each other, doing little partnership deals. Like it's nice because we got this, you got to put your IRA, you got to put your self-directed IRA to work, right? Or 401k, whatever. And uh, you can't, you know, there's rules, like right? can't do it with kids, all that other stuff. So it's like, there's, if you, if you're in a group, close knit group where you're all kind of educated the same way, you have a same sort of understanding and, and, um, and goals, then you just trade money back and forth to each other. It's awesome. Makes yeah. it a lot easier. You create your own private bank doing that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Great information, Jason. Hey, I appreciate you as always taking a little bit of time out of your busy schedule. I hope that everybody got uh, some benefits out of this. Uh, let us know in the chat if you guys thought this was great. Uh, we'll continue to do this. We're going to go uh, live again in a couple of weeks. We're going to talk actually talk about private money lending in our Ooh. next segment. So uh, stay tuned for that. Go on the Directed IRA 
website and register for our next one, uh, next two uh, workshops. We're going to talk about private money lending. So uh, thank you guys. Thank you again, Jason. And um, well, again, we'll have the recording out to you guys by tomorrow. So thanks again, everybody. Have a good rest of your Great. week. Thanks, Jason. Thanks. Thank you.